All right, so we're going back to Portugal, and, and this is Sintar. It's an area south of, of the capital, and this is where the old imperial castle, castle was. And, and this was also, it's a hilly fortress area, and so there's a lot of Moorish castles that are there that you can wander through. But this is the old castle where the king of Portugal used to live. It's a very interesting um, castle. It's a combination of, you know, uh, Moorish, Influence and Dr. Zeus, so it's weird. It's, it's got pastels. It's got you know these these areas that you see in Moorish castles, but then it's got weird stuff in it. It's a it's a it's a mishmash of different types of architectural patterns. But it is up on a hill, and and this area has got about a half a dozen hills, and there's like palaces or you know winter homes or or fortresses on all of the hills. So very interesting place. And you can see it is very much on a, on a hillside. And so um, you have to go with these um, special buses or you can hike it if you'd like. But again, um, pastel colors, very weird pastel colors, domes, kind of almost minarets as you're looking here. So very much a, a mishmash of conditions. And then again here, you've got kind of a coat of arms, but again, you've got this pattern. It almost looks like um, kind of the, the stuff that Gaudí did in, um, in Barcelona. And, you know, he was a little bit later. He was like, uh, you know, 100 years after this, but, but very much the same bizarre architecture. And again, your garga gargoyle, you know, protecting things, but yet your arched, you know, Middle Eastern looking entryway. So very, very interesting uh, mishmash of stuff. So. If we're going to talk about IOLs, we have to go back to Mr. Ridley, Mr. Harold Ridley, a surgeon from London. And so this plaque is in St. Thomas's Hospital. It's very interesting. Alan Crandall and I were there. This is many years ago. You see a little bit less gray hair and Crandall looking a little younger. But um, St. Thomas's is right across the hospital from, right across, I'm sorry, the river from Parliament. So we went over. We said, where is the Ridley plaque? at which time the information people looked at us like, you know, we'd asked for where the moon landing was. I mean, they had no idea what we were talking about. So, you know, you didn't really need IDs in that era, so we just kind of wandered the hospital. And sure enough, in a lower hallway, away from everything, we found this plaque. The first intraocular lens for the treatment of cataract was implanted by Mr. Harold Ridley at St. Thomas's Hospital. And so this is uh, interesting. This plaque is there. We found it. We took our pictures. And so, uh, Mr. Ridley, there's Mr. Ridley, he lived to be 94 before he finally passed away, but he was very interesting. He, um, he was a, a surgeon in the Royal, you know, Royal Medical Corps during the Second World War, and during the Blitz in London, the British Spitfire uh, pilots were trying to protect London from the Nazi bombers, and their uh, cockpits would be hit by machine gun fire. The cockpits would shatter and bits of the cockpit would go into the pilot's eyes. And what Ridley noticed is, is that these were inert. And just by fortuitous circumstance, it turned out that the British um, RAF cockpits were made of plexiglass, which is PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. And so Ridley was smart enough to say, gee, this material is inert inside the eye. Maybe we should consider this for you know making materials that go inside the eye. Now legend has it, I don't know, I, I didn't get this from the horse's mouth, but legend has it that he was doing surgery showing a student, you know, in the late 1940s taken out of cataract, and the student asked an innocent question of, well, what are you gonna put a lens back in? And and no, of course not. We give people glasses. And so I'm not sure if that's what really spurned Ridley, but Ridley decided that he wanted to go ahead and to um, develop an intraocular lens that you could put in after doing cataract surgery. The second fortuitous thing is that Ridley was doing very crude extra caps at that time. Now surgery at that time was with loops. And so you'd go into the eye with what's called a graphy knife. It was a sharp, long knife. You punctured the limbus on one side, go all the way across the eye, puncture the limbus on the other side, saw the cornea in half. Then you lift it up and you go in there and you grab the lens capsule and you just tear it off. Kind of like, you know, you guys do your Rexies at the VA. I don't even have anybody here who's ever done a Rexis, so you don't even know what I'm talking about. But, and then you would manually squirt out the hard nucleus and 
and flush out the, the cortex and then really design the lens to go into the posterior chamber where the normal crystalline lens was. And what Ridley's lens was is it was round, like our normal lens. It was very thick. It had a little rim around it. And if it were placed into the capsular bag and centered well and surrounded by the bag, this is an eye that had a Ridley lens for 30 years. And this was the eye with what we call the Mayaki view. You cut an eye in half coronally. You look at it from the inside. So it's like you're sitting at the optic nerve looking out. Here is the capsular bag. Here's the pupil we're looking from behind. Here's the ciliary processes. And here's this Ridley lens within the bag 30 years later. Well, unfortunately, with those crude extra caps, the lens didn't end up in the bag. And in fact, would end up getting captured by the optic, would scrape on the iris, would get dislocated. And these lenses really did not do well afterward. They, they turned out to be kind of a disaster. And one of the reasons is this is the edge of the lens. And so they didn't have sophisticated polishing techniques. So you can see that's very rough, very irregular. So it's a big, rough, irregular lens. And so lots of problems with that. So I just want to give you a little bit of a background of history with Mr. Ridley. So Mr. Ridley put these lenses in. And so he came to the United States, crossed the pond, went to the uh, AAO, Academy of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology meeting in Chicago and presented this data on his intraocular lenses, at which time the president of the American Academy stood up and said, if anybody in the United States puts these disastrous lens in a patient eye, I will personally testify at the malpractice suit. So this was the um, response of organized ophthalmology in the United States. And I must add, that response continued for 20 years. So the organized ophthalmology, especially the AAO, was vehemently opposed to intraocular lenses and FACO, I might add. So did their best to, to try to retard progress for at least two decades, if not three. So poor Mr. Ridley went back to the continent, continued doing his work there. One of his students, uh, Peter Choice, um, said, well, you know, these extra caps are pretty crude. Most people are doing what we call intracaps. You're removing the entire lens with the capsular bag and everything, and so you don't have anything to support an IOL. So why don't we put an IOL in the anterior chamber? And so Choice worked on many different um, lenses in the anterior chamber. In his first one, this was the Choice Mark I. And so I don't know why you, you call it Mark, but it sounds kind of space age and sounds kind of cool. I don't know if you remember any you know, the shaving blades, the Mach 5 shaving blade. And so it sounded very, very good. And so this was his first one. And it's a solid PMMA again. This is very solid. And so uh, Mr. Choice played around with these for a while and eventually came out. This was the Mach 8. So this was his eighth one. And so this was the one that, that, that really attained widespread use. And this was the Mach 9. He cut down the bulk a little bit. But the idea is it's a one-piece PMMA lens. And so the problem with these lenses is that you have to size them perfectly. And the sizing then was very crude. You'd take a caliper, you'd measure the limbus, the so-called white to white, and you'd add one. And you'd say, OK, the anterior chamber is 11.5 millimeters in diameter. Therefore, you put a lens implant of this. And so the standing joke at that time was that these lenses come in two sizes, too big and too small. And so what happens is, is when these lenses are too big, you get them to scrape against the iris, you'll get little hyphemas that are going along here, and this is an eye that is viewed now anteriorly. We've removed the cornea because it was totally clouded, but you see the basic, the cat's eye pupil. And so you can see when these are too big, you get a definite ovaling of the pupil. This particular lens happens to have one of the foot plates stuck in a peripheral iridectomy, because you do a peripheral iridectomy to prevent pupillary blocks. So lots of problems with these. And you can see if they were too big, the other thing is when you're putting them in, you could tuck the iris. So this is the anterior chamber angle. Here's the cornea. Here's the trabecular meshwork. Here's the iris with an IOL haptic tucking that behind there. Now I want you to note something. Look at all the pigment in the trabecular meshwork. You guys are going to know all about this next week, okay, glaucoma next week. So, you know, you ended up with pigment dispersion, you ended up with chronic inflammation, and so 
lots of problems. When these were too small, they would propel her. And so they could literally turn around inside the anterior chamber of the eye. So some issues. They moved this from the actual area? From scraping, literally from scraping on, on the iris. Now, the other problem with these is they were poorly fixed, poorly finished, in addition to being poorly fixed. And so the problem is um, American companies started to try to rip off these, these lenses in the late 70s, early 80s. And this was an early American ripoff. This is the edge of an IOL, believe it or not. So I wish I still had this picture. When I was a, a fellow with Dave Apple, we took a Coke bottle and broke it and did EM of the edge. And the edge was, was you know, no, no you know, worse than that. So, I mean, you can imagine what this is going to do inside the eye. Um, I had the displeasure of being a young fellow presenting a paper on these lenses saying how bad they were, uh, at which point Mr. Choice was the moderator and made it very clear that, that these were an unlicensed ripoff, not his normal lenses. So he was very perturbed that, you know, we were presenting this as a choice lens, so it was a ripoff. But this lens caused so much inflammation that the term UG was coined. And you guys may hear of that now, uveitis glaucoma hyphema. So they would cause chronic uveitis from scraping on the iris. You would get hyphemas from rubbing on the vessels, and you'd get glaucoma from the pigment dispersion. So UGG syndrome really was named with these choice ripoff lenses. So uh, American companies started getting into this finally now. This We're talking now early 80s. And so this is a long time from 1949, 1950. But American companies started to say, OK, these IOLs are going to be something we better start making. So they started making what we call open loop. IOLs. And by open, it means that the, the optic is still PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, but the loops are made of polypropylene, proline. Um, you know, proline's a main plastic. They make Gore-Tex out of it, all kinds of other things. So proline is what these were made of. And people started designing these. And so this was the era where guys were drawing these on napkins, and IOL companies were popping up left and right. And so this was the Azar 91Z lens. So Azar was an ophthalmologist down in New Orleans, designed this, and it was closed loop. And the idea was is that you didn't have to size these so well. They wouldn't you know, um, cause so many problems. And indeed, these lenses looked pretty good for about a year and a half to two years before they started causing problems. And so you know, companies jumped on the bandwagon right away. This was uh, another lens. They squared it off a little bit. Same thing, PMMA haptics. I'm sorry, PMMA optic, proline haptics. And you can see various different kinds, but they're all the same idea. They're all closed loop lenses. Now, this was an interesting one. This was called the Stable Flex. And it had literally eight of these little loops all over the place. And this was one, unfortunately, there was someone in, in town here who put a whole bunch of these in. And even into, into like the 10 years ago, Alan Crandall and Randy Olson were removing these. These were a bugger to remove because these little haptics would get sneaked into the angle. And so heck of a time getting these out. But this was when, you know, again, there was a new lens coming out every week. Now, what happens with these lenses? It turns out that these closed loop lenses, if you put pressure on them, if you squeeze them, the, the closed loops would not take that squeezing and so they vault the optic forward. So if people rub their eyes or even just squeeze their eyes, that optic was bouncing up and down on the cornea. So what would happen is you would get corneal edema, what we called pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, and there was a rash of them. In fact, in, uh, from 1984 to 1989, the number one reason for doing a cornea transplant worldwide was pseudophagic bullous keratopathy because of these lenses. And so you'd get edema, but the second thing that would happen is, so here's the chronic edema. You know, get this bullous keratopathy. This is a cornea, believe it or not, cut in half, totally opaque. These loops would go into the angle, and the angle that you get fibrotic bands all the way across them. This is a gonioscopic view into the angle. And you would get that, and so what you would do is you'd get chronic UGG syndrome. Also, you'd get chronic glaucoma from the angle closing off. And so these closed loop lenses would look good for a while but then they would, they would look bad, and so you don't see these anymore. And here's one of the loops digging into the, ang digging into the iris root. So this is cornea up here, iris, pigment thin. Look at that loop. That loop was dug in 
almost to the major iris circle. So these, these would, would really cause significant issues. And here you can see again an eye, the cornea has been removed, and this is one of these stable flex lenses, totally sneaked into the angle. And you have these crude iridectomies that were made when we put them in. And so these caused real problems. And this was an interesting lens. This is called the Dubroff lens. We just saw one of these in the lab, you know, last month, which I was really surprised. You can still see these once in a while. This had three loops like propellers. And it had three loops. And the problem is, is it was the worst of all worlds in that these loops would go into the angle and totally close off the angle. So if you can imagine three broad loops, you would close off half your angle. So these cause lots and lots of glaucoma. And here again is a person with chronic UGG syndrome plus corneal edema. So real issues with these implants. And here, remember from the cornea lecture, here's a bullae. All right. What the heck is this? Anybody? The retina. What's going on with that retina? Edema. Cystoid macular edema. So you could get with chronic uveitis, you get chronic cystoid macular edema. So they call that UG plus. So it's UG plus cystoid macular edema. Okay, so with that, Charlie Kelman, the guy who invented the FACO machine, by the way, said, well, you know what? These closed loop lenses are causing real problems. The solid one piece lenses are causing problems. Why don't we make an open loop lens? And so he played with an all PMMA lens that was shaped like a seven. And so in fact, we used to call this the pregnant seven because it looks like a seven that's pregnant. And so the pregnant seven, turned out these were pretty unyieldy. And so he thinned down the haptics real rapidly, made them a little bit more flexible and called this the, uh, the tripod lens or the OmniFit lens. And so Kelman would argue at that time that three was better than four. So you notice there's not four little foot plates, there's three. And the argument was that if you're in a bar, you've got a three-legged bar stool on an uneven floor, it's more stable. And that was his argument. And so people barely even use these, and Kelman immediately figured out, you know, three isn't better than four. So, you know, again, like a month later, he made his present lens. Now, does that look familiar? Okay, this lens came out in like 1984. So here we are 34 years later, this is still our anterior chamber lens. And so you can see it's one piece PMMA, but it's open looped. And so the idea is if you squeeze that, you know, rub the eye, squeeze the eye, instead of vaulting that optic up and down, the haptics would take the squeezing. So almost like the leaf springs on a big truck. So, you, know, you see them all the time, right? When you go hunting, you know, you got them big leaf springs on that truck. And so the leaf springs take up the, the slack and so these don't vault. And so this is a lens we use to this day if you use an anterior chamber lens. So one piece, PMMA, open loop, four point fixation. And the other thing is, if you look at these haptics, instead of curving out where they block the angle, they curve in. And so there's only a couple little points where this um, intersects the angle. So these are well, well tolerated. So this is kind of the ultimate anterior chamber lens. So here's the old Apple core. I don't know who the guy with the mustache is, but. Um, we didn't have a big enough office, so we would take the corner of the old cafeteria, and this Dave Apple would dictate stuff, and we had fellows and students, and we'd lay, you know, EM papers out here and write chapters and all, so this is how it was done. And this is the predecessor of the Ocular Surgery News, which you still get today, so we held that up because we were on the cover of that when they took this picture, so this is the Apple Core. Well, at the same time that all this evolution with anterior chamber lenses was going on, people in Europe were looking at iris fixated lenses. So they're saying, hey, we can't put a lens in the posterior chamber. There's no support. Anterior chamber IOLs are causing corneal edema. Why don't we clip an IOL to the iris? So this was the original Binkhorst. Binkhorst is an ophthalmologist in, in um, I never forget, because Binkhorst and Worst, one was in Belgium, one was in Netherlands, but in any event, one of those two countries. 
in Europe. And so the idea is, is the two of those loops go in front of the iris, two go behind it and eclipse it to the iris. This was the worst lens, and we used to joke about it because this truly was the worst lens. Because what he tried to do is he put a little peg on here that would clip it to the iris and hold it on there. And then he put two holes in here so you could suture it to the iris if you had to. And so these would cause iris atrophy, they would cause UG syndrome, they would cause glaucoma, they would cause all kinds of problems. The other problem is these haptics were made out of proline. If you put proline next to uveal tissue, proline degrades. So this was the so-called mud flap degradation. And you know, again, you think you never see these. Last month in our lab, we saw proline haptic with degradation. So it's still to this day, you can see that. So this was the impetus to get away from proline with the, the haptic materials. So when proline wasn't working well, they said, why don't we make a loop out of titanium? Indestructible, inert very, very heavy, and so it didn't work, it didn't work. So this had titanium loops. If you think about it now, imagine someone goes in an MRI and they flip the MRI scan and that goes you know, so probably not a good idea. So those lasted not even a week, those lasted about two days, you know, with, with the titanium haptics. Were they doing rabbit studies with this lens? Have no. They discovered that, okay. No, these, all, these are all going into humans, these yeah. Going into these are all going into humans. So, here is a worst lens, um, Jan Worst, and here is the, the positioning hole here, and there's a suture in here that's broken. Um, a little suture here that, that used to go from here to here that's broken. And there's a tab here trying to hold it on. And look at the iris is all chewed up and chronic edema and chronic gug syndrome. So these really didn't, didn't work that well. This was a uh, haptic that was behind the iris, and this is all iris and lens tissue attached to it. So, so these could cause some real problems. And again, they looked good initially, and then 18 months, two years later, they'd start having problems. And so here's the idea. You would clip it to the iris, loops in front, loops behind. Now, what happens if you dilate the eye widely to look at the peripheral retina? Sometimes these would fall into the vitreous. So and people would have to turn people over and put them face down in the operating room and operate underneath them so that that lens would come forward. So it was very interesting. So my favorite is, is the ads were coming out. So there's a company called Copeland that made an IOL that looked like a propeller. Two loops anteriorly, two loops posteriorly, and here's the Copeland elves wishing you Merry Christmas. And so they'd send these ads out, little elves making the IOLs. And so, Copeland was an interesting one. It was shaped like a propeller, two loops in front, two loops in back, and you would get a square pupil. So here's the loops in front. The loops would be behind here. Look at the pigment on the surface of the implant. Look at the iris stuck to it. So again, chronic UG syndrome, difficulty dilating, all kinds of problems. And here is a Copeland lens looking through the cornea. That's the view you got with the severe corneal edema these would cause. So my favorite is, at this point, you know, a lot of companies were advertising, this lens is proven safe and effective, you know, <laughs> discontinued. So it was interesting. I, I saw that they, it was safe and effective, but they still discontinued it anyway. All right, so finally, we get to the more modern era. And now remember, you know, Ridley was doing a crude extra caps. They didn't work well. Most people were doing intracaps. You'd remove the whole lens, capsular bag, the whole thing. But in the late 70s, early 80s, people started to use microscopes when you did your surgery. You didn't do loops. And they started to think, gee, maybe we could try to you know, preserve that capsular bag. Started going back to doing extracapsular surgery. So Steve Shearing, who was an ophthalmologist in Las Vegas, said, well, if we're going to put in a posterior chamber lens, why don't we put a little haptic like a J on there? to support it in the back. So this was the first posterior chamber lens. So people looked at that and they said, wow, that's a great idea, but that J was very stiff and came straight out. It tended to ovalize the capsule. So immediately people started looking at different ways to do this. So a guy named Simcoe put a broad C loop on this implant. And then Bob Sinsky put a modified J loop. He moved that loop over 
and he made it a little bit less severe. And so this was the kind of standard lens that we used for a decade. And you guys will use a Sinsky hook in surgery. So, so same guy, Sinsky just passed away a year ago, but this was our go-to lens in the mid 80s. So this was a Sinsky lens, modified J loop. And the idea is, is you try to put them in the capsule or bag. If you couldn't put them in the bag, you put them in the ciliary sulcus. Again, we still do that if our bag is not intact. But the bag is better than the sulcus. You still get scraping of the iris. You still get other problems. So put it in the bag if you can, rather than in the sulcus. And here's what happens if you put an IOL in the sulcus. Look at where the haptics have disrupted the posterior iris pigment and then the optic can scrape on there. So you can get some pigment dispersion. And here is a haptic that was in the ciliary sulcus. You've got a big submarine ring here, iris, cornea, peripheral anterior synechia, haptic all the way again into the ciliary body there. So you want to put them in the bag, not in the sulcus. And finally, here is a Miyake view of a modified J-Loop IOL in the bag, quiet eye, tolerated for 30 years, doing well, and that's where we want to put them. So here you can see the haptic surrounded by the capsular bag, away from the pigment, not digging into the iris, not causing disruption. And so we finally started putting implants within the capsular bag. So as implants got better, as we started putting them into the capsule bag, the companies got better at polishing them. And so this was now a lens that's what we call tumble polished. So remember I showed you the one looked like a broken Coke bottle. Tumble polishing is interesting, and again, they still use it to this day. You put the IOL in a cylinder with a bunch of beads and some polishing material, and you tumble it for like seven days and it polishes it. So when you were kids, did you ever have a rock polisher? You know, you put the rocks in there and you grind it for seven days. You have to put it in the garage because it makes so much noise. But same idea when you polish IOLs and look at the finish on that. So when you, if you do scanning again now of, of IOLs in this era, they're gorgeously polished. And so you don't get any problems from that. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of show you what the previous surgeries used to look like, because you guys never see these now. But so this was an intracap. So you would make an incision from stem to stern. Now, because the eye is wide open, you really worry about it. So you put some special stay sutures in here. Then you lift up the cornea. You'd go in there with a cryoprobe. You'd stick the cryoprobe to the capsular bag. You put in what's called alpha chymotrypsin to dissolve the zonules, and you would pop the whole lens out. Now, sometimes the vitreous would come out, sometimes not, but you know this would leave a nice clear view. These guys, once you once you um, refract them, would be like 2015. But um, you know you can imagine there's a high incidence of cystoid macular edema. You had some real issues with the intracaps, so we started going to do extra caps. And the idea is, is now you do a capsulotomy, you'd go in there, you dislocate the nucleus, you put a lens loop behind it, you pull it out. And then you put these two little stay sutures in there, you tie them down temporarily, and then you'd go in there with a manual IA and you'd suck out the cortex and you'd put in your IOL. So these are extra caps. Now, those of you who are going on some third world trips, we're now doing small incision extra caps. The difference is instead of making this incision that you have to put sutures in that smiles, we now make a frown incision way back on the sclera that self-seals. And so we can do extra caps in the third world without stitches. So hopefully you guys will get a chance to learn that on your international travels. And last but not least, finally Charlie Kelman invented the FACO, which allows us to take out an IOL through a small opening so that we can put in a, an, an implant that we don't have to expand the, the, um, the incision. So we can make a smaller self-sealing incision. Now, Kelman was a smart guy. He was at his dentist and the hygienist was using an ultrasound to take off the plaque. And he said, what the heck is that? And she said, well, it's an ultrasound. It grinds the plaque. And so he was trying to come up with ideas on how to take out a cataract. So he 
went to the company that was at that time called Cavitron, and they developed the first ultrasound to grind up the cataracts. Now, the first time he did a FACO, it took like two hours to do and tremendous amounts of energy. He was doing it on an eye that was functionally blind, but um, still, it, it again was the, the basis of the FACO we use today. Incisions have also changed, and so we used to make scleral corneal incisions. You'd make an incision through the sclera, you would tunnel forward into the cornea, and then you'd enter the cornea. Howard Fine said, well, wait a minute now, you know, why do we need to go back in the sclera? Why do we need to even disturb that? Why don't we make our incision in clear cornea? And again, that's what we do today. So here's a clear corneal incision. You don't use stitches on it. You don't disturb the sclera. You don't worry about bleeding. So clear corneal incision. Now, the final step in all of this, sir. Quick question, quick question. So I was reading in the BCSC corner cataract book, and it talked about, you know, the rates of endophthalmitis and different things you do, like H. Cameron and that. One thing it talked about was having lower rates of endophthalmitis of scleral tunnels. Yeah, 12, 12 years ago. Okay. And so again, the BCSC is put together by the Academy. Everything the Academy puts out is a decade behind the times when it comes to cataracts and IOLs. And so um, when people first switched from scleral incisions to clear corneal incisions, there was a bump up in endophthalmitis. Right. As people got better at making clear corneal incisions that didn't leak, that bump immediately went down. And that was 10 years ago. Right. And so, but again, it's in the BCSC books. If it's in the book, you have to put that on boards even though it's not true. So there is no increase in endophthalmitis right now with clear corneal incisions, but there was initially. Okay, so people said, wait a minute, now we've got this FACO, we can make a three millimeter incision, why would we expand it to six to put in an IOL? And so this was the impetus toward making a foldable IOL. So it's interesting how cataract removal technology and IOL technology have gone kind of footstep with each other. So you'd get an advance in how you do cataract surgery, then you get an advance of IOLs and they move up. And so the smaller incision you know, really was the impetus to foldable lens. And this was the first foldable IOL. It was a plate silicone, and a guy named Tom Mazzocco invented it, so they called this the Mazzocco taco. It looked like a rolled up taco. This was the first foldable IOL. So this is what it looked like, it was a plate silicone lens. It would go into the capsular bag nicely. Well, people looked at that and said, well, that's, that's good and, and fine, but why would we get away from our standard three-piece lenses, which work real well? So that led to the development of a three-piece silicone lens. So the idea is you fold it with a folder, put it in the eye, unfold it in the bag, and it would work well. They eventually came up with injectors that did this. And people looked at silicone and said, well, okay, silicone is a relatively low refractive index, so these lenses had to be pretty thick, you saw how thick that silicone lens was yesterday because in order to bend the light, they had to be pretty thick and they weren't terribly compatible. And so um, they looked at different materials. This is a hydrophilic acrylic, what was called hydrogel. And then they started looking at different ways of doing hydrogel. This is in a rabbit, very compatible material. And lastly, they started looking at hydrophobic acrylics. And this is the acrylic material we use well, goes to this day. So this was when Alcon first came out. It was a three-piece hydrophobic acrylic, and now we've got you know one piece with haptic hydrophobic acrylic. So I'm not talking about modern IOLs. You know, Liliana will talk to you guys about that. I wanted to do this as a history because you're still going to see these. You know, you saw in the lab the other day. We still see these lenses 30 years down the road. You're going to be at the VA. You're going to see one of these. You're going to go, what the heck is that? But I'm hoping that by you know, giving you guys a little bit about the history of these lenses, you'll know what the issues were at the time, but also if you see these in clinic, what the issues that you have to look for now. So that was just to call that a trip down memory lane. And again, this is like you know, going to Whoville here, you know. So going back to the main castle, there's a very interesting mishmash of, of, of different architectural styles. But again, up on a hill, Beautiful views out onto the ocean from here. So next week we'll get back to real pathology, read your glaucoma, and we're going to talk a lot about glaucoma next week, okay? Questions? All right, very good.